You know, some people thought the Connecticut Sun might be a little disrespected as the team entering the playoffs, but so far they have maybe looked like the best title favorites here. We've got our Connecticut Sun beat reporter from the next, Jacqueline LeBlanc, joining us to go over the first round of WNBA playoffs. You're locked on women's basketball. Let's go. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Yes, good morning and welcome. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. I'm Alex Simon from Bay Area News Group, helping fill in for Howard Migdal and all of the fine folks at the next. Thank you for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every day. And please remember that Locked On Women's Basketball is free and available on all platforms. And you can even watch it on YouTube every single day. But Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, come join us each and every weekday. And you never know, maybe occasionally a weekend or day as well on Locked On Women's Basketball. Jacqueline LeBlanc, you were in the building at Mohegan Sun last night. Uh, the Connecticut Sun, you know, a lot of people pick them as the team to be upset in the first round. I have to imagine that for as much of the hashtag disrespect the Connecticut Sun have felt over the years, Kurt Miller had to know that he was a popular upset pick. Did he not? I think he definitely sensed that. Um, it was before before they played Minnesota in the last regular season game last Sunday. Um, in Kurt's pregame, he kind of talked about how they felt a little a little bit like underdogs and, and how that was really different from from last year when they were the top seed. You know, they had that that double bye and um, people had high expectations for them. They underperformed. This year, they feel like, or at least Kurt kind of alluded to, that they felt like they had um, kind of lower expectations, that they're trying to over overperform it in the playoffs. Um, I actually asked Courtney about that a couple days later when they were preparing for the playoffs. I was like, do you think disrespect is still real and alive? Like, how do you guys feel about that? Um, and Courtney, real cool, played it off. She said, you know, she thinks everyone is on notice now. She doesn't feel like they're disrespected, that, you know, people know they, who they are the different weapons they have. Um, so she was real calm and cool and collected about it. But I feel like, you know, there's there there's definitely inklings, especially if they're on W Twitter. They've got to have seen it. Um, the, you know, Dallas beating them twice in the regular season has definitely been a big topic leading up to this game, um, even though the circumstances are a little bit different. So, um, they're so not what, what I'm, what, I feel like it might be there a little bit. What I'm hearing is it could definitely be possible, but at least the only people acknowledging it is those of us that are, you know, broken brained on social media to this point. Yeah, uh, could, could be. However, this this is also one of the only series where we really had any inkling as to what the matchup was going to be ahead of time. Actually, both of these teams were locked into their respective seeds with multiple games left for both of them. We knew kind of in the middle of last week, like almost a full week plus ago that it was going to be a 3-6 Connecticut Dallas matchup which kind of probably let both teams maybe scout it out a little bit and as you came into last night I, there was certainly a lot of questions and then Dallas actually got healthier than they've been in a while we had both Satu Sabli and Isabel Harrison who are both on the injury report be able to play still missing Enrique Gumbawale but for a team in Dallas that was kind of surging into the playoffs this injury good news also kind of perhaps disrupted a little bit of the rhythm that they had been building in their rotation. I still thought Satu was good last night, but boy, Connecticut's defense was just sensational. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's what they do best. They know that's what they had to do going into this game. Dallas has been so hot in the month of August. I think Howard actually brought it up a couple days ago. Um, I believe it was since, um, since here, McCowan's been inserted into the starting lineup. So that was 13 games after the all-star break. Um, Dallas had an offensive rating of 110, which is absolutely insane. That matches the 2019 Mystics, um, the 2022 Aces from this season who are having a crazy offensive year. Um, their offensive rating was like 108. So 
if that tells you anything of how this hot this team has been coming into coming into this playoffs, I think, you know, Connecticut and their defense was definitely prepared for it. Um, they mentioned before the Minnesota game at last regular season um, that it was kind of like a tune up. You know, at that point, they already knew they were playing Dallas. Um, they had to guard Sill, which is kind of similar to, to guarding Tierra McCowan, um, Marina Mabry, a little bit similar to, to guarding Kayla McBride. So they really kind of used that game as, as a tune up there and um, to help prepare them. But I think, you know, we've asked them a couple times and they really have credited their their defense and their intensity to their energy and, and being locked in being focused. That's what they attributed it again to last night. Um, and then Vicki Johnson, on the other hand, coach of the Dallas Wings, she kind of attributed her team's loss to their lack of energy and and their lack of intensity and kind of falling apart there. So so definitely interesting how it kind of comes down to, to those factors. Um, one more thing on this is just Dallas is a really good rebounding team. Connecticut's obviously the best rebounding team, um, but Dallas, ha- Dallas is good at, at keeping them off the boards, especially offensively, which is um, kind of rare to see in some of these Connecticut matchups. So Dallas really had a lot of potential there and kind of out rebounding the ball. And, um, you know, that kind of comes down to, to effort and energy and intensity and, and Connecticut won that battle last night. So, yeah, I was reading something on 538. Let me go make sure I uh, see who the author is correctly. I believe that would be Howard Megdal. I've never heard of this young, young chap that I should keep reading. Uh, but yeah, well, Howard pointed out that I think was super fascinating kind of compared to what public expectations were was that, Connecticut actually in 538's advanced stats view was considered a co-title favorite, but I was seeing a lot of people kind of use this as their popular upset pick in that regard. And we kind of came into last night, you know, Connecticut obviously has been on the doorstep of winning championships in the WNBA, but is one of the few teams that has kind of been good in what you would call this little five-year run here that Connecticut's been one of the elite teams in the league. They're basically the only one that hasn't won a title. You've got Chicago, Las Vegas has not won a title as well. So Connecticut and Vegas are the two, and they are the two co-title favorites in 538's numbers. And you kind of look at it, and those two teams were the two that came through this first round where you're like, wow, they sure looked the part because last night Connecticut's defense was absolutely sensational. Dallas only scored... I believe it was 19 points in the first, 18 in the second, 13 in the third, 18 in the fourth, keeping teams under 20 each and every quarter, 68 total for the game. More to the point, holding Dallas 41% from the field, forcing 15 turnovers. Like you mentioned with the rebounding, I think it's really important against Dallas to limit the offensive rebounding opportunities. They only allowed eight in total. They grabbed 27 of 35 rebounds that were available on Connecticut's defensive end. That, to me, is all of the signs that you want if you're Connecticut that this is going the way that you want it to go on the defensive end, which then unlocks your offense. Absolutely. And another another good Kurt Miller-ism is that offense starts on defense. You know, it's probably popular across the league, but Connecticut Sun really drill that in, into their team. And, and this year, it's really true for them. Like, they've been really good at, at forcing turnovers, forcing steals. Now the AT is back in the lineup. Natisha Heidemann's had a good couple games with good steals. Dijanae Carrington's kind of amped that up in her book as well. Um, but yeah, forcing steals, going in transition, um, capitalizing on those opportunities. And, and um, this is just the prime opportunity for them to do it. I do really actually want to kind of break down how the rotation was used last night, just because it really is a fascinating thing. It does help, obviously, that they were able to build a big enough lead. But before we do that, if you, as a fan of the Connecticut Sun, let's say, are interested in kind of seeing, I believe this team's going to go all the way. I think this is the year they get the title. Go check out Bet Online. For all of your title odds, they've been having WNBA numbers all year. Even after this first round, I can go right now to bet online and see that the Connecticut Sun have the second best odds of any team after the first round in the WNBA. Vegas is still maybe the favorite, but a shocking upset in Chicago has all of a sudden surged Connecticut into that prime 1B position over at bet online. So if you head to betonline.net, it has you covered with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. You can make all of your WNBA gambling thoughts happen with Bet Online. Head over to Bet Online. Bet Online, where the game starts. Jacqueline, I 
I love the way that this Connecticut offense can be so diversified, especially with what the insertion of Courtney Williams into this group. It has helped even Odyssey Sims, who they added very late in the season, has come in and really been able to help their offense kind of be a balanced attack. Last night, John Quill Jones only scored 19 to lead the team, but it was because five players are in double figures. Another two get to eight. Pretty much this team is not necessarily one where it's one player needs to go out and score, but it does make me wonder how these minutes get distributed. And I'm fascinated with the fact that Connecticut was able to pull out a win last night and they only needed 22 minutes out of Dewana Bonner, 25 out of John Quill Jones. They are able to keep everybody except for Alyssa Thomas, who I think that uh, that 538 writer, Howard Megdal, I think I saw him call her a human cannonball recently. That seems like a app description. I also think she's just a robot. She played 31 last night, and I think Kurt Miller has to like forcibly drag her off the floor. What did you take away from how the game was able to play out for Connecticut to kind of let their starters get some rest a little bit more to maybe keep that group healthier all throughout the playoffs? Yeah, well, you really hit it on the head there. Kurt really appreciates when his team is balanced. This team is made up of five, six all-stars who all have the potential to score and they're at their best when their shots are equally distributed, when, you know, the weight is not on just one person, you know, Connecticut has that luxury of having, you know, a crazy um, all-star three-person post rotation. They have Dewana Bonner, they have Courtney, Natisha, who can get hot at any time. Um, so they are really at their best when they are equally distributing those shots, when everyone has a chance, you know, no one's forcing anything up, no one's taking bad shots. It's really moving the ball around. Um, another thing that stood out last night is they had 25 assists on 37 made field goals. That's really good for them. Um, you know, they really moved the ball around. Um, it was really, really good for their chemistry. Dallas, on the other hand, had 11 assists. And they talked about it in the post game. They are not good when they assist the ball t 11 times. Um, Vicky Johnson kind of attributed it to them not really playing together. And on the other hand, Kurt, you know, really talked about how great their, their togetherness was and, and their desire and their effort and, um, how you they all really know that they need to come together and it's not about one person or, or individual stats. I talked to Courtney Williams earlier this week and she echoed the same thing. You know, Kurt said a big part of this series and the playoffs in general will be their backcourt production and how efficient their backcourt is. Courtney, you know, echo, echoed that sentiment, but also said, you know, if her shot's not falling, if someone's shot's not falling, someone else's will be. So, you know, do your part to get them the ball, do your part to rebound. And um, they have really come together as a, as a collective unit. And especially since like the last, since the all-star break, um, you've really kind of seen this intensity and, and focus and it's just kind of different. And Kurt said um, a lot of that is that they're just, they're just having fun. They had a, a rough kind of stretch leading up to the all-star break. They lost four of six games. Um, and then all-star break, they kind of gave them an opportunity to reset and kind of lock in on, on what makes this team really good and um, just have fun with each other. So I think that is a real big part of their success and will definitely continue to be. Uh, I Just to show people, I actually did do the math here. It's probably not easy to see because it's the camera flip, but that is more than two thirds of your shots that you make were assisted. That's usually a pretty darn good number that you would love to be at, even if you're just a general basketball team, but one that doesn't necessarily always have that level of assist rate, that makes it really difficult if you're able to move the ball like that. I think this Connecticut team, what has surprised me the most is the willingness of Kurt to kind of keep his guard rotation pretty quick and flexible in that regard. Dijanae Carrington has stepped up very well all throughout her second year, but it's become kind of a four-player rotation at the two guard spots, pretty level, and I think that's part because this group loves to use defense to set up its offense, and when you are missing Jasmine Thomas, as they have been for most of the season now, but that is still one of the league's best perimeter defenders, one of the best guards on the defensive end, to kind of use the group that you have, now inserting Odyssey Sims in there. I saw Nia Cloudon. It was mostly garbage time minutes, but there was a little bit of earliness, early time for Cloudon. It feels like Curtis got a group that certainly he would love to have Jasmine Thomas out there if she were healthy and available, but... This group has had time now to find that rhythm together at the guard level, especially on the defensive end, which, as Kurt has said, as you already have said once on the podcast, that's where they set everything they do, starting from the defensive side. Yeah, I feel like this year with their rotation specifically, like if you look at the 
you know, rosters of Sun Past in the last couple of years, like their starters play anywhere between 30, 35 minutes, 40 minutes even. Um, this year, it seems like that sweet spot of, you know, if everything's going well, the each starter plays around 25 to 30 minutes has been a real goal for for Kurt. Last night, he said he didn't want to play anyone over 30. The only time he did it was Alyssa, and she played like a minute over. Um, and she was a near triple-double again. So <laughs> it must have taken – well, probably not. But, like, to take Alyssa Thomas out at that point, you know, says a lot, I think. Um, also, they've gone away from their – super big four post lineup having db Bree jones at jj all out on the floor at the same time um they've gone away from that they kind of have a rotation to work with with Bree jones at and jj one of them will probably be on the bench um if there are opportunities if a team brings a bigger lineup which dallas has the the potential to do um you could see them all out on the floor together he says you know <laughs> when anyone in that group is sitting on the bench gives them a lot of anxiety which i'm sure a lot of connecticut sun fans feel at times too um but I think it's just a good balance like Bree Jones last night played you know almost 21 minutes she got a quick uh third foul in the second quarter that they weren't super happy about, or the second quarter that they weren't super happy about Kurt pulled her um you know she didn't come back into the game until like three minutes left in in the third quarter when Connecticut was starting to kind of pull away um that's a luxury for him I think you know not having Bree Jones out there, you know, she's one of the best offensive players on this team, you know, really does a lot of work in the post for them. Um, but, you know, she was able to, to finish out that fourth quarter. If she fouled out, you would have the the luxury of inserting Alyssa Thomas back into garbage time. So um, I think it's really interesting. You know, it's been a work in progress all year. I'm sure it'll continue to be a work in progress throughout the playoffs as they match up differently with, with different lineups and whatnot. But I feel like that is really kind of helping them with, with their balanced rotations and, and their balanced offense. And it, and it sets up, I mean, the whole idea of the two one format that the WNBA has is as a higher seed, You've earned the right to have more home games, but they, for reasons of reducing travel, for several other reasons, the WNBA has told the higher seeds, you don't have to travel if you take care of your business at home. Connecticut has, for years now, been one of the best teams playing at home. And Sunday morning, they will get a shot, excuse me, Sunday morning on the, the best coast out here out west. Uh, it'll be directly at noon in Connecticut and on the east coast. Uh, but Sunday morning, they'll have a chance to take care of business on their home floor, not have to make a return trip to Dallas for a win or go home game three. I have to assume that Connecticut has doesn't necessarily have any extra level of confidence. It's just this is what we do with what happened last night with a pretty dominant win at home to head into Sunday. That's got to be kind of where they're at is this is just how we take care of our business. Yeah, that's obviously the goal and, and what they wanted to do is get it done at home. They do really well at home. Their crowd really thrives when they're at home. Um, you know, Kurt has said time and time again throughout the seasons that it's really hard to beat a team twice in a row, especially when you're doing these like kind of back to back series. Now we're actually in the playoffs and we get series. Um, Kurt says it's not easy. And, you know, he last night he mentioned that, you know, Dallas, <laughs> they um, blew out Dallas in, in one of those games. And the other two games, Dallas, you know, won the series. So just because they had a 25 point victory or, or whatever it was last night doesn't mean that they're actually going to win the series. You know, Kurt said he's going to watch 48 hours worth of film over the next two days leading up to that game. Um, but there's still like mistakes and things to clean up on. So they were trying to seem that, you know, they're not, um, they're not going to take this for granted. I, I don't think, you know, they're going to come out. They're not going to, um, you know, they're not going to take uh, Dallas for granted. And I think that was really the key heading in heading into this first game. Um, you know, Dallas, again, it goes back to, to the energy and the intensity and the focus. And um, Connecticut had had a better opportunity there. I'm doing a tiny bit of math again. How many hours did Kurt Miller say that he was going <laughs> to? That, that was me. That me, 48 hours is me. But Kurt did say, you know, he's like, after wins like these, Coaches there's, don't there's, there's only 62 yeah. hours in between games there that I was starting I was thinking about it and I'm like hold on a second if he's doing that what how much sleep are we getting like what oh no what, please no. don't attribute my math to Kurt Mill <laughs> uh but so, yeah he said you know, they don't go home and put their feet up they go home and watch film so I'm sure Kurt's gonna be I'm sure he watched film all throughout the night he will today um I don't know what goes on it in coaches rooms but 
Well, and and the interesting part, we'll we'll get a chance to look ahead and kind of know when we come back on Monday. But there's a possibility that Connecticut, even if they take care of their business on Sunday, they might already know who their opponent would be, which will certainly be an interesting thing to learn with the two seed Chicago Sky currently down one nothing at home to the New York Liberty. Chicago will have to win on Saturday in order to keep that series going to a game three. On the other side of Thursday night's action, Jacqueline, I believe you were quite busy during the most part of the Seattle Storm Washington Mystics game. Uh, how much did that did you actually get a chance to watch? Because I kind of want to talk a little bit about the finishing sequence there, if you were I able got, to see. Yeah, I got home and uh, the third quarter was like just ending and then it was past midnight. So when I really started kind of like waking up and paying attention, um, was about five minutes left in that that fourth quarter. But I definitely caught the end of the ending up there. Which was, honest to God, one of the best basketball games we've had all season. These two teams are incredibly evenly matched. I think it was pointed out there was a whopping two-point difference at halftime and a one-point difference between these teams at the end of the third quarter. Only the type of result that truly makes you wonder uh, just how far apart these teams are. This was going to be such a blowout either way, clearly. But I feel as if this is a personal take here that I'm going to throw at you. I feel like last night was maybe the shot for the Mystics. And I wonder if there's any semblance of regret waking up this morning, J more than just normal playoff loss regret, but you get a big night from Elena Deladon. If you're Washington, 26 points, 11 and 17 shooting, you get a pretty diverse effort all across your offensive board. You get 16 each from Atkins and cloud Shakira Austin looked fantastic for a rookie playing in her first playoff game. And on the other end, it was a, relatively speaking, meager offensive night from pretty much everybody but Stewart. Tina Charles, only four of nine for nine points. Jewel Lloyd, four of 11, two of six from three. She did end up making some free throws down the stretch and went six of six from the free throw line to score 16. But for the most part, this felt like the type of way a game would go where I would have like, this is the one Washington steals. I feel like these two teams are still very evenly matched. And we just saw them play a back-to-back -back only a few weeks ago where right after Seattle took a very close game, Washington responded with a win. But those were back in D.C. And I just wonder, when you were watching down the stretch, did it feel like kind of these are all massive games because it's only three games, you got to win two. But did it feel like that was a missed opportunity in your mind for the Mystics? And it, it looks really daunting from here. Well, First off, I want to say that this matchup is probably my favorite of the playoffs. This is the one I was hoping for and just watch it. I think that was like kind of what woke me up when I was kind of watching the end of that fourth quarter is Elena Deladon and <laughs> how she could not miss and just how fun it is to have her back in the playoffs. Um, but yeah, I think it's definitely a missed opportunity. They were up by, you know, a couple possessions before it got real close. Um, that last possession, I'm sure that is definitely a very disappointing way to go out. Um, but then just like thinking about the Mystics, thinking about playoff Deladon, their defense, you know, like you said, it was really just Stewie until the end of the game and it was Jewel Lloyd and, you know, Jewel Lloyd and Stewie are, are just going to do those things. But containing the rest of the team seems pretty impressive. Um, I think Washington actually responds in, in Seattle. I just don't see Elena Deladon going down to two games, um, especially, especially like that, how it ended last night. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. I am crossing my fingers for a game three. I think that would be super fun. I'm sure we all would love seven, 10, 50 games of, <laughs> of this series of, of Stewie versus Elena Deladon. Um, but yeah, I I think it's over for for the mystics i don't think they probably feel that way either i think their defense was really impressive and that's definitely something that they have to work with and when deladon can't miss it's <laughs> it's hard to beat her but you know last night was a little unfortunate and, for them and, and, and yet <laughs> yeah when she can't miss it's hard to beat her and yet seattle was able to beat her last night which is why right. i wonder if that was the one uh one thing to point out uh two actually uh, when you said that's kind of that woke you up over at playback, which by the way, folks, if you are wanting to watch these games with some fun people and join the next, as you do so, the next is over at getplayback.com slash room slash the next. We're there pretty much for every playoff game. The rest of the way we'll have our people hanging out 
talking about the game, talking about all that comes to mind. I do happen to know that one Howard Megdal, who was a part of the playback last night, was thinking about leaving that game at halftime because, yes, it was a little late on the East Coast. And then the basketball energized him to stay awake and stay on all through the rest of that one. Uh, the second thing, and this is a thing I tweeted out last night because so many people were rightly saying, this feels like a series we could get seven games of and feel like it wasn't long enough. Nine. I, I just, my thought would be, let's just have this be like a tennis tiebreak. And it's just <laughs> whoever takes the first two game lead in the series wins it. If that happens after game two, Seattle's earned it. But like if, if they're tied one, one, this series shouldn't end at three games. We should see like if they have to go, you know, if it's gotta be six, four, as the final, whoever ends up finally taking the two-game lead in game 10. I don't think anybody's going to complain about that. Do you? No. No, I don't think so. I love the tennis tie break. I <laughs> think it's super fun, um, especially when like it goes a, on. A set schedule. Who needs to worry about when the next round begins? Now let's just play win by two, basically, but with games, not just in the basketball. So <laughs> uh, I, I truly, and Howard, we love him dearly, but he has been right to point out, we have very rarely during their careers seen a healthy Elena Deladon and a healthy Brianna Stewart go head to head. And it's it's one of those things that I think is appointment television right now. The fact that they are going head to head for at least one more game, potentially. And uh, as you said, I'm not sure I even want to say this, but I don't think anybody here would complain if we got a second one of these for a third game of this series here though I'm sure Seattle fans would like to not have to worry about having to go back to D.C. Jacqueline LeBlanc, thank you so much for joining us. You will be at Mohegan Sun on Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. Where can people find your coverage of what you do and kind of what you're posting on social when you're at the game on Sunday? Yeah, well, of course, you can go over to thenexthoops.com. Um, I'll have a feature there leading into this playoffs. Um, I'm trying to write one for after the game on Sunday, so we'll see how that goes, whether they win or lose. Um, but, yeah, you can also find me on Twitter at Jack D. Leb, J-A-C-Q-D-L-E-B. I'm pretty new to social. I'm not a big tweeter, but I'm trying to um, get a little bit better about that for, for playoffs. So I have time. I have some time to prep. I've obviously got everyone at the next is awesome at, at tweeting their game coverage. Um, um, so, yeah, find, find me there. Jacqueline does some incredible stuff in Connecticut, and you guys should be following her if you're interested in any way at changing the hashtag disrespect <laughs> narrative. Uh, you can go ahead and follow me at Alex Simon Sports. I'm part of Bay Area News Group. We would love it if you keep an eye on what we do out west. You never know. There might be a WNBA team in the Bay Area sometime soon. We'll have to see how that goes. But in the meantime, I will, I'm sure, be hanging around all of the next spaces uh, as I tend to do, and we hope to see you guys joining us this weekend on Playback with all four playoff games over at getplayback.com slash room slash the next. Thank you, everyone, and we will see you on Monday.